Well, I'd like to thank Brad for that uh, very generous uh, introduction. Um, I think it's good that he mentioned that I'm a writer at the Washington Post um, because I think as journalists, and, and I've been one for almost two decades, one of the things that we don't like to do is make predictions, right? We're dealing with the facts, things that we've come across, and, and we're not guessing. Um, so of course I'd like to start off tonight by making a prediction. <laughs> uh, and, and that is that it's highly likely that the first Latino president of the United States has been born. Now, he could be or she could be an infant right now or in second grade or in high school or maybe even in the United States Senate. Uh, but it's clear from looking at the United States and the changes in our demography uh, that Latinos will continue to play a larger role in the national dialogue. You know, if you look at the statistics, um, in 2004, 7.6 million Latinos are said to have voted in the United States. That's according to research that's been done at the national level. In 2008, in the presidential election, that jumped up to 9.7 million. Now there are estimates that in this coming election, in November, uh, that the number could go all the way up to as high as 12 million. And that number is only going to grow. Uh, so I think it makes it all the more relevant to examine the life of somebody like uh, Marco Rubio. Um, in, in some respects, I came to think of him a little bit as, a, as almost a test case for how the American population relates to a Latino politician. Um, and, and that was reason enough for me to write a book about him. Uh, because, you know, in the same way that you look at uh, the reasons why you want to write a newspaper article, I think you also have to ask that question when you are setting out to write a book. Um, and I've come up with three answers. One was the answer that I had when I first thought about doing the book. Another is one that kind of evolved while I was working on it. And the third is one that sort of came to mind afterward. Um, and they were different, uh, but I think that uh, they're not mutually exclusive. Uh, so what was the, the first answer to the question? The, the, the first answer was that this guy has probably better prospects of uh, going to what we would call in Little Havana uh, La Casa Blanca or the White House um, than any American Latino politician in our history. Um, and so I've decided that I'd read a few things from you, uh, to you, uh, that kind of illustrated each of those three different answers. Um, and so I think I'll start with answer number one. And this took place in August of 2010. For an instant, she hurtled toward the floor, a slender, delicate right shoulder knifed downward, a cane flipped sideways. Nancy Reagan, tiny, fragile as a china figurine in an ivory-colored suit, was crashing. Many in the capacity crowd at the Ronald Reagan Library in Simi Valley, California, couldn't see what was happening. They clapped, lovingly, oblivious. But before their applause gave way to gasps, the synapses of the young senator escorting the former first lady to her seat fired perfectly. Marco Rubio, his hair parted just so, a valedictorian smile on his face, tugged the aging icon toward him. He leaned right and swung a hand beneath her left arm, catching the 90-year-old just as she slanted forward almost parallel to the floor and bound for a bone-chipping thud. Rubio, a 40-year-old who looked a decade younger, moved with the sure agility that he once flashed on the high school football fields of Miami. He wasn't fast, but he was quick, 
his high school athletic director, James Colsey, always thought. On the football field, there's a difference. Fast means you run at high speed. Quick means you react at high speed. Quick means you get to the right spot on the field at precisely the right time. Sometimes being quick is better than being fast. It was August 23, 2011. The figurine didn't shatter. Soon it was clear this was a moment. A Los Angeles Times blog published a frame-by-frame -frame sequence of photographs beneath the headline, Marco Rubio to the rescue. They showed Nancy and Marco smiling at each other, then Nancy happily looking into the audience, then starting a slow motion tumble as the senator reaches over to pat her hand, then Rubio saving her. The former first lady's anxiety at that second is written on her face as she grimaces and closes her eyes. Conservative bloggers and their readers, who had been reliably laudatory about all things Rubio during his quick ascent in the Republican Party, pra praised him. Hero, Marco Rubio, saves a falling Nancy Reagan. That happened a couple of weeks before Simon & Schuster called me. Um, and I can remember watching it on television that night. Um, it was on the evening news. And I, I think that uh, sometimes political careers are aided by the serendipity of timing. And being there when this icon of the conservative movement happens to trip with the cameras rolling is just another example of how Marco Rubio has been at the right place at the right time throughout his political career. Um, he ran for the United States Senate when nobody thought that he had any chance, but he really had the good fortune of running in a three-person race. And in politics, it's great to run in a three-person race because it splits the electorate. And Marco Rubio became the conservative choice in Florida. Charlie Crist had been the governor, very powerful. Everyone thought that he was invincible. And he was running as a Republican. But Rubio was started to make inroads, and Crist dropped out. Kendrick Meek was this Democrat, African American from northern Florida. He was in the race, too. And all three of them being there benefited Marco Rubio, because Marco Rubio was able to present himself as the most conservative voice in Florida, present Charlie Crist as someone who was, as he was called in newspaper articles, the most liberal Republican governor in the United States. And when Crist decided to run as an independent, all of the moderates were being split between him and Meek. And Rubio was able, through espousing the tenets of groups like Club for Growth, really capture that race. And in the end, it, he ended up winning it by a lot. Um, so, so all that I knew when I got started on the project. I didn't know a man named Pedro Victor Garcia. Pedro Victor Garcia is Marco Rubio's grandfather, uh, a name I had never heard before I started research on this project. And uh, you know, Brad has mentioned uh, the discrepancy about the senator's family story of coming after, Q after Castro. Um, but I also wanted to know about Pedro Victor Garcia because in a few speeches, the senator had uh, spoken about him. Uh, and the big influence that he had on his life. And so one of the things you gotta love about Washington is we've got lots of little rules, great tiny little rules. Uh, and I found out through talking to a bunch of researchers uh, uh, that if you were born 100 years ago, all of your immigration records are transferred uh, from the Immigration Service, the USCIS, uh, to the National Archives. 